coming to you from the Paranormal Warehouse, Destination Mystery paints the story for paranormal content, abnormal adventures, and the fun behind the investigations. Each week, Mike and Melissa will bring a new adventure that includes going to some of the most remote places in the West. They will tell the story behind the investigation and share with you the evidence they discover. This is not your regular paranormal show. These episodes will bring new content from locations that no one would think to investigate or explore. We will not only tell the spooky story, we will go to the location where the spooky story originated. Fasten your seatbelts as we take you on an adventure that will make you question what's normal and what's paranormal. Hello, paranormal peeps and weird wanderers. You are watching Destination Mystery. It is our fifth ever live Facebook show on the Paranormal Warehouse. Um, I am Ghost Girl, or Melissa with Ghost Girl Memoirs. And I'm Mike with Paranormal Treasure Hunter. And you are watching Destination Mystery. And as you can see, we've got a special guest on with us tonight that we will introduce in just a moment. Welcome, everyone. We're happy that you could all join us. Um, We are Destination Mystery, and we have our show on the Paranormal Warehouse every Wednesday at 8, no, it's 1030 Eastern Standard Time. It's 830 our time. Um, If you are joining us via podcast um, and you are interested in any of the pictures or the evidence that we share, we post that on our blog and our website, which you can find at www.destination-mystery.com. Um, if you do uh, follow us on any of these, please like, share, and subscribe. It will really help us. Um, we are located on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Breaker Audio Podcast, or Pocket Casts, and Public Radio. Um, and we would like to do a, a few thank yous real quick. We want to thank Tyler for our music, Cosette for our trailer, Mark for our logo, Sierra, Lauren, Taylin, Bella, Hobbs, and Curtis with Paranormal Teens, and Michelle with Time Forgot. Um, we also want to thank our spouses and all of our friends for putting up with our weirdness and our crazy adventures and for supporting us. And most of all, we want to thank all of you as viewers for um supporting us and making this possible, making this something that we can do on a regular basis. Uh, Tonight we've got Sierra with Paranormal Teens helping out with the comments and I'm having some issues with, um, hi Sierra. (laughs) I bet she was real happy that you did that. Um, If we are unable to see your comments, I apologize. I'm having a hard time seeing them, but Sierra is gonna try and get those for you. Uh, a, quick, a quick shout out to our sponsors. We've got Cash Valley Endocrine and Family Medicine. We want to thank them for keeping us going and helping us stay healthy. Idaho Falls Plumbing Company and Idaho Falls Diesel Company for um, helping Mike keep his truck in tip top shape and, um, and everything else that we use when we go on these adventures. So if you're watching right now, if you could do us a huge favor and share on your page. This will help get the word out. We'd really appreciate that. Um, And we wanna say hi to Paul, Chantilly, and Sally who have joined us so far. Hi. From what I can see, if I miss anybody, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is not working very well for me. Uh, This is an interactive show, so please comment. Um, You can just comment on the on the Paranormal Warehouse comment section down below where our show is. And real quick before we get started, Mike, I wanted to give a shout out to Ghosty Girls podcast. They sent me um, some cool stickers this week and a really cool postcard. And we see it there. It's better. They have a really fun podcast. It's also on Spotify. I think it's on um, Google and Apple and all those too, but they do a really fun podcast every week and they have a really cool Instagram page. Um, And this this says um, that I'm a new member of their Weirdos Club. So that's pretty fun. Thank you. Okay, anything, uh, Mike, you wanna say before we get started? Not yet. Go ahead and introduce. I'm excited. So, uh, 
uh, Chant Chantley is from Saskatchewan, Canada. I hope I'm saying your name right, Chantley. And Vancouver, uh, Marcia is from Vancouver. We've got our supporter, Chris, on. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Um, he says that Mike wants a, a Weirdos Club sticker. He don't need one. He already knows he's part of the club. I'm the president. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Chantel, is that how you say your name? Hopefully. I'm really sorry if I messed that up. Okay. Um, we want to introduce our special guest that's with us tonight. We have Liz Marshall. I had the amazing opportunity of interviewing her for a, um, I'm actually, for those of you who follow me on Ghost Girl Memoirs, I am a parapsychology student and I have gathered a lot of information on near-death experiences and I had the wonderful opportunity of interviewing Liz this week um, and talking about her near-death experience and we've invited her to come on the show with us today to do a question and answer. Um, it's going to be a lot of we're going to we've got some really cool information to share with you and if any of you out there have any uh, near death experiences, deathbed visions, out of body experiences like that, and you want to comment, um, feel free. We'd love to hear what you have to say. We want to welcome Michelle and Irene from Tokyo, Japan. Thank you for joining. Um, Liz had her near death experience on March 13, 2014. Um, so it's pretty fresh, roughly the six May. years ago. Is that what I said? It's May. Yes, May. May. What did I say? March. Oh, sorry. Anyway, Close May. I don't sleep anymore and words are hard. So um, Chris says, hi, Liz. Uh, most of us, most of us believe that we have a physical body and a spiritual body. Once our physical body dies, our spiritual body lives on. The big question is, does our consciousness survive the physical death? Is our personality or consciousness located within our brain or is it part of our higher self? Many theorists exist to support the survival hypothesis, including the first law of thermodynamics, which is also known as the law of conservation of energy, which states energy can be changed from one form to another, but it cannot be created or destroyed. Thus, the total amount of energy available in the universe is constant. The survival hypothesis is not complete without this law. This law is supported by Albert Einstein's famous equation. We all know what that is. E equals MC squared. Um, I actually have a sticker of that on my wall. Energy is equal to mass times the square of a constant. Therefore, we do not die. We are simply converted from one energy form to another. And that is what Mike and I believe happens to us um, when we when we pass away. We're, we're still here. We still have our personalities. We, um, we still exist. We're just in a different form. How does that, how did I explain that? Okay. I think we still look more or less the same too. Maybe not as hairy. scarred or hairy or zit covered as I normally am, but hopefully better. Yeah, I believe so too. With the advances in medical science over the last century, more and more people are being um, resuscitated after having died. And it is estimated that approximately 8 million Americans claim to have had a near-death experience. But this figure may be underestimated because many are afraid to talk about what they have experienced. Dr. Raymond Moody coined the term near-death experience in 1975 when he wrote the book, Life After Life. What he found interesting was the similarities that existed in each of these cases, regardless of the person's background or belief. And as I have been doing my research on this, I have found the same thing. Um, most near-death experiences are very similar. And we are gonna start off with a question and answer session with Mike and Liz. Um, real quick, we have Dale, Judy, uh, who says, I feel a lot of energy feeling me. This is not a good energy. It's painful. Um, Dale, I would suggest that you um, maybe try meditating and, and clearing that painful energy away from you. And maybe we can discuss a little bit more about that later. Um, but I think that, that I've got some tips and tricks that might be able to help you. Um, 
I don't, Irene, I don't know what that is. A uh, ferrothorax? Oh, pneumothorax. I'm sorry. And if I didn't go to the hospital, I would be dead. Wow. Um, and then I just missed that comment. Somebody was talking about an energy force. Uh, Chris says, Judy, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, Mike and Liz, go ahead. Liz. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, would you like to uh, tell us what happened? Your, uh, the circumstances surrounding your near-death experience. Well, I was born with a really rare disease called hereditary angioedema. And it swells your body all the time. It cuts off your throat. That's why I have the trach. Um, and the trach is because this, of this whole experience. And um, I just had a throat swell and they intubated me. And then that was it. I don't remember much after that, except for this one experience, which was in the middle of my hospital stay. I was in a coma for several weeks and... Um, yeah. Does that answer your question again? So they always talk about a tunnel of light. Did you happen to see a tunnel of light? What was that when, like? Well, uh, it, it was not a tunnel per se. For me, it was a line of people that were in a room that went as far as I could see. And then it just gradually disappeared and was dark after that. So there were like hundreds of people. Hundreds of people, wow. Did you know For them? Me. Yes, I knew them all. All of them? Yes. Friends, family, ancestors? Um, I think mainly family and ancestors, but I'm sure wow. there were friends in there as well. Um, and it seemed to me like the furthest forward were the ones that were on the earth more recent. The ones closest to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the they were there. On. The, the very back was like the beginning of time kind of thing. Wow. Wow. Did you uh, see yourself by chance? Like looking down at yourself or it's, did you it's feel like you left your body? Um, it, it's weird because I did look down at first, but as quick as I looked down, I was automatically like standing there. And um, my two grandfathers were actually the ones in the front of the line. And they were the ones that I saw first and they started talking to me and introducing me to other people. Oh, wow. John, is, like. John has joined us from the UK. Welcome, John. Did you go, did they take you anywhere? Were you like in a room outside? Did they take you anywhere? I was in a room. It was a room that's- um, What'd it like, look like? Had, it was all white. Um, and like gold, it was really bright, bright, like the noonday sun kind of bright. And there were mirrors both sides. So mm -hmm. it, it just, um, it, it, it reminded me of a place I've already been to. Like I'd been there before. Really? Well, what were y'all wearing? Everybody wearing the same thing? Yeah. Different colors? Just no, like it's just normal. all white. Everybody's wearing white? Yeah, 100% hmm. white. I don't even think people were wearing shoes. So it was nice and warm, too. Yeah. Or did you notice? So, Just comfortable? Yeah. Hmm. It was. It was really like going home and like getting a hug, you know, by your relatives you see now. So. Um. Were you Sorry, Dale just commented. Judy had made a comment about no longer being scared of dying. And or, I'm sorry, I don't remember who made that comment because I can't see it. But Dale uh, commented, oh, it was Irene. Irene, you shouldn't be scared of dying. Here on earth is not your permanent residence. Our home is in heaven with God. I agree. I agree too. Were you, were you religious before your near-death experience? Yes. Yes? Very did much it, so. Did this experience change anything did it validate yes. it yeah i think that i was really religious but the one thing that like i was wondered about or struggled with my faith in is the afterlife you know i always like thought well what if you know we really don't go anywhere what if we're just 
buried in the dirt and nobody remembers us. And this experience helped me to where I have that knowledge that I am going to go to heaven, that I am going to see people I know and I love and that it's not the end. And it's, and it's, I think it's Chantel. Um, she said, I was the one who was scared to die just because I won't be here for my family that still lives here. Um, Liz, how do you feel about, since you were able to see your relatives on your, on the other side, would you say that they still may come and visit you or, or watch over and protect you? Absolutely. What would you say to, what would you say to Chantel? Yeah. yeah. I do. I think that if you, um, live your life where you're happy and at peace that those entities i guess even not they can come whenever you really need somebody and you might not have what you need you may and it may be just like comfort a warm feeling but i i do think that it's it's a positive thing and that after this life we'll get to have that warm feeling and be with those relatives that we have when you say entities who do you think those entities are? For me personally, I think that they're family and friends that have already passed. I would agree with that. And that they knew me, most of them, at a time or another. And that sometimes I feel like them very near and sometimes I don't feel them very near. Do you feel like they're near when you need them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like I have to pray for it. And just say, come on now, I, I need a little bit of extra today. Um, but most of the time, it's like, I don't know, it's just that spirit or that entity that is here. And a lot of times it's people that are, you know, long past and I didn't know them personally. Um, John says he wants to ask a question. So go ahead, John, put it out there and I'll read it once you do. When you were in the hospital when you when this happened, correct? Uh huh. I was just in my uh, like the ICU room, I guess, is where I was at. Was any but was John your husband there in he the room in the with room. you at the time? Did any uh -huh. did he see or experience anything while while you were experiencing this? Um, he said that his he was um, calm and that it, he could feel the moment that my heart stopped. He knew without. Yeah, he knew hmm. right then that I was dead and he was peaceful about it. But I don't I don't think it was a piece like, oh, good, she's gone. I think it was a piece is, OK, she's not suffering anymore. Hmm. Has John answered you back, Melissa? Not yet, but Chris put out there. Um, I, he was answering a question from somebody else about letting them know that their husband is still there with them and that hope them that they can find some strength and peace. So we appreciate that comment, Chris. Thank you. I can't see it all, unfortunately. Did you experience what they call a life review? Like maybe a quick Reader's Digest version of your life or what maybe you should be doing or could have done better, anything like that? You know, it was really quick. I, I do remember some things, like they were moments, like I remember like seeing myself as a kid, I think I was riding a bike and then seeing my, uh, my daughter being born. And, you know, that's, that's kind of I, just a few things. It was a very short amount of time, it seemed. So it almost seems like they were the important and happy moments in your life that you were able to see? Yes, very much so. Well, I, I don't remember any negative or not being at peace in any time during, during this, even though it was a very traumatic event. And I, I, I w did have heart failure and respiratory failure on other instances too. But this one is the only one that I felt anything and had all this. That's interesting. How has that changed your life for right now? Um, I think it keeps, the more I think about it, you know, it gives me that peace and that yearning to be able to see them again. And I am a very religious person. And part of my religion is to be a good person, to live and to follow the commandments. And I feel like it helps me 
to want to be a better person, a better mom, a better wife, because I want to see them again. Um, and I want to be with them and have that feeling again. So John, this sorry, John just asked his question. He said, my, my dad recently died last month, but when I go see his grave, I talk to him, but do you think he hears me? Sorry, John, I can't see the rest of the question, but um, both Chantel and Chris said, yes, he can hear you. John, you can feel his presence when you visit his gravesite. I've actually had an experience when I went to a gravesite for a friend um, just to see. And, um, oh, are you saying, I think John's saying he can't. John, I do believe that your dad can come and um, be with you when you need him. How, how do you feel about this, Liz? I, I agree 100%. I, I think that sometimes we don't get everything we need on this earth with people and that we have that opportunity to continue that relationship and maybe maybe it'll help give you peace that you know that he's there and I don't know I I believe strongly that the spirit is with us their spirit or God all the time you know my father passed away when I was really young and I know there were times when he was there watching out for me when I needed it and I don't think you have to go to their gravesite to be able to feel it I I, oh, I quite agree. I quite honestly think that when you need it or when you ask for it, they'll be there. You just have to be willing to open up and, and be able to feel it and try to listen to what they have to say to you. It has to be true because we're still alive from all the stupid things that we've done. And that we all still the accidents do. we've been in yeah. and haven't, <laughs> we've walked away from. Somebody's exactly. definitely watching out for us. We're limped away from anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I have instances um, in my life, and this didn't really happen before, um, much before this happened. But now, I, you know, there's one time I wasn't breathing at home, and I felt somebody shaking my feet, and it was a relative that had already passed. And just different instances like that in my life that, that give me hope, and um, I know that they're there. Liz, that just gave me goosebumps. That That is actually a very, um, to me, it's just an overwhelming feeling of happiness that mm -hmm. they're still there. Chris says, John, uh, John doesn't feel his presence and I don't feel my dad's presence at his grave, but I do feel him at other times. So that's good to know. Thank you for that comment. Oh, um, Chantel says in my dreams, until I visited his grave. I had a dream of a friend who died and he kept appearing in my dreams until I visited his grave. So he was wanting you to go see his grave, I guess. Huh? <laughs> Our physical bodies are buried there, but the spirit lives on. I yeah. think Definitely. wherever you are and you're in need of help, they can be there to help you. Uh, talking about this, I, I was helping a good friend of mine move a big old heavy vending machine. There were several of us. We we're trying to take it down the stairs and I don't know this was a near death experience, but it, it should have killed him. But that we lost control of that vending machine and it slid down the stairs and and slapped him up against the wall and I kind of got knocked around the corner. And when I stood up and looked at him, he was white as a ghost and I are you okay? Did it hurt you? He's like, No, it didn't touch me. You look like something happened. And he's like, Well, my grandpa stopped that mach that machine from hitting me. And that was all he said. And we didn't say anything about it again, but that was a heavy machine. It, it should have smashed him. It didn't even, I don't think it even touched him. But so did he see his grandpa or he just- He knew saw he his was... grandpa standing there holding it Well, he moved and then- That gives me he, chills too. Yeah, he didn't say much about it, but that was, that's what he, uh, that's what he said. It's, it's taken me a long time to where I can speak out about my experiences. I don't know why. I was always afraid someone might be judgmental or say that didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. And it is something extremely personal, too. And you want to be able to right. keep that, you know, close to you and not have somebody ridicule, ridicule or judge you because of it or or right. or say that you're making it all up because it's right. yeah. 
that's understandable. And I think that's why more people haven't come forward and talked about their experiences for that very reason. Yeah, I think that. And then I also think too, just it's, it was such a personal experience. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, overwhelmingly, like I didn't tell anybody for a while. I just kept it like, and just kept thinking. And then finally I told my husband and then it was, I felt like it may be okay to start telling people. So. Well, I think your story is an inspiration to those who have questions. So I think you're helping a lot of people out by sharing your story and we appreciate that. Thank you. Did you have more questions, Mike? Or I had not, I didn't know. Is that all of them? The, the, there's one on the very bottom. You maybe you better ask that one. Is that the, the scientific one? Yeah, you're we the kind, science one. It, it, well, I'm not. I, I'm not. But we kind of answered this question already. But um, there was a little something that I learned in one of my classes, and it was that scientific experiments have shown that theta and delta waves are more active in those who experience near-death experiences. This is uh, where your dreaming takes place. And many people with these experiences claim to stay in close contact with those they met on the other side. Um, and this could explain why those theta and delta waves are higher. And so we, the, the question was, do you feel closer to those on the other side? And I think we already, we already answered that. But I mean, scientifically, they're able to prove why some of this stuff could happen. Yeah, one more question when you're done. Go ahead. I'm done. So why do you think you were sent back or came back instead of staying there with them? If you don't mind I, answering that. I, yeah, I tried to stay there. I wanted to stay there. And I talked to them and they're like, no, you're not. It's not your time. You're not supposed to come yet. They said, you have a full life yet to lead and this is not your time. And I remember crying and saying, but it's so peaceful here. I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. And that's when I just felt strongly like, you know, you need to be a good wife and mother and raise your child. And that was it that quick. And then I woke up and it was like a week later or something like that. Did you have the trait before this happened? Well, actually, that's kind of what made me go into my respiratory failure and heart failure. I was intubated, and every time they tried to pull out the tube, I would flatline. Mm. And so my husband, after a few days, that day was like, okay, this is not working. We need to try something else. Um, I think she needs a trach. Mm. And so they did the trach um, right after this happened. When you were in the room with your relatives yes you didn't have this problem did you have it that you the problem or any of your health problems then do you remember yeah i had i had been really really sick but i, I mean while trach yet while you asking. no while you're having your near-death experience with your relatives on the mm -hmm. other side did you feel any of the health problems that you feel now up there no i was no. like a hundred i was like a hundred percent different Mm. Um, like I've gained a lot of weight with this disease and I wasn't heavy. I didn't have a trach. I didn't have the skin issue. I just, everything was like perfect. I'm kind of looking forward to not hurting <laughs> right. all the time. Exactly. And that's kind of why I think I wanted to stay because I just was in so much pain and had a lot of sorrow and depression and it just, it, it happened when I needed it the most. Everybody there loved you and respected you. That's got to feel good. It does. Yeah. You I'm, brought up a th one I'm, more thing. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you brought up it wasn't your time. My one thing I've wondered is w w some people it is their time. Some people it isn't. Do you have any thoughts I, on that? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that um, it could have easily been like, okay, this is your time. Say, you know, you're never going to see your family until, you know, they die or whatever. Um, but for me, after I, like they told me and I realized, okay, I've got a life I need to lead. I was okay with it. So do you, do you feel like the decision was up to you or you had no choice or that after they said that you felt like maybe you should go back? 
Just exactly. curious. That's what happened. Is hmm. they told me, no, it isn't your time. You need to prepare to go back. And, you know, I said, no, I want to stay. And they said, no, it's your time to go. And then I said, okay. Hmm. All right, Melissa. Sorry. I I'm, I'm, I know I'm missing a lot of comments, so I apologize, but Irene um, agreed that when she shares her experiences, people think she's nuts and no one believes her. My advice is um, either don't care, you know, keep sharing and, and don't let other people bother you because it, it's your experience. You know, it was true. Um, you, <sighs> What am I trying to say, Mike? We said this last week. The older you get, the more you don't care about what other people think of you. And the less you care about what people think of you, the freer you're going to feel. But you can't deny something that happened to you. And eventually these people may experience it and then realize what you said. And it may help them. Maybe not right now, but maybe later on. Well, and Irene, I think too, you know, it, it's your choice whether you want to share it with people. And, and if it's something special uh, that you want to keep to yourself, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But just think about the people that you're helping that maybe don't, that you don't even know about. Um, maybe by sharing your experience, you're able to help other people work through some of their questions and experiences and help them feel some sort of sense of peace even if they don't say so. So you may be helping a lot of people regardless of what other people say. What do you think, Liz? I think that the more, you know, um, unguarded you are, the more you share these things, I think the more peace I have in my life. So I don't feel like I'm keeping the secret because I'm worried about what other people think. I really don't care what they think. And so I do share it. I'm very selective of how I share it and who I share it with. But, you know, if someone asks me about it, I, I tell them I'm religious and this is how I feel. So. Um, Shan, oh, go ahead, Mike. I just say, that's how I feel. I, if they ask me, I'll tell you. And I kind of feel them out first and, if you start to tell and they kind of their eyes roll back and they, you know, they don't want to hear. So I just kind of drop it right there. But if they ask and want to know, I think we should share it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Chantel said um, she wants, uh, she doesn't want to have to see her relatives in spirit form, I think was the question because it would scare her. I, I, I can see that being scary when you're, if you because they're relatives or because they're in spirit form? <laughs> yeah, there's some relatives I wouldn't want to see either. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, sure, that's going to be scary. But I don't know that they're always going to show themselves in spirit form. In fact, I don't think that yeah. happens very often at all. But it's definitely a peaceful feeling for those that you love to be able to let you feel their love when you're needing it. Yeah. Um, and then the other question that Chantel asked is what happens to people who commit suicide and come back? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think it would be any different. Sorry, I, I'm guessing that she's asking about people that are trying to commit suicide to have the near-death experience and come back. Um, I don't know that it would be any different other, you know, maybe, maybe they're, you know, they're in so much pain and their mental illness is, you know, taking over and they've tried to commit suicide and it, they were sent back and maybe it's actually helped them because they know they have a higher purpose and that it isn't their time to go. I don't know. I, suicide is such a hard topic to talk about. It's, it's so, so painful for so many people and. Um, we don't know what, what they're going through. We, we don't. don't we don't know what they're going through. What do you think, Liz? She. Sorry. Am I on there still? Yeah, there you, you are. Oh. Um, does anybody have any specific questions they'd like to ask Liz? My only near death experience is riding with my mother in law in a car. But <laughs> that's it. Mine's with my son. 
Um, this is a little bit delayed, so we'll see if anybody has questions for you, Liz. Um, but I wanted to share a quote that I found <coughs> by, um, this is by Mary C. Neal, who, I don't know if she wrote the book To Heaven and Back or if it's just about her story, but when she tried to describe her experiences, this is what she said. I feel as though I'm trying to describe a three-dimensional experience while living in a two-dimension world. The appropriate words, descriptions, and concepts don't even exist in our current language. I have subsequently read the accounts of other people's near-death experiences and their portrayals of heaven, and I am unable to, or I am able to see the same limitations in their descriptions and vocabulary that I see in my own. Do you have a hard time describing exactly what you saw and went through in English terms in, in our limited physical experience? Um, I guess so. I, and it's really, you know, it's like if you ask, you know, three different people about a movie and what it was about, you're going to get three different responses. And so I feel like it was such an individual experience that I don't know if anybody could ever view it the way I did. Right. It's very specific. It's a room that I've been in before. And, um, you know, if you tried to describe someone that hasn't been there, they're like, really? Like, this doesn't make sense. Or I, I don't know. So Chantel has a question for you, Liz. She said, how has it changed your view on death? Well, um, by trade, I'm a social worker and I did do grief counseling for a while. And I stopped because I felt just felt draining all the time because that that near death and hearing about loved ones that have passed um and now that I've been away from a little bit I just started kind of doing that again um I just find that everybody has their personal their personal way to do things and to explain things so did that answer your question sorry my little girl's having a plug in my phone <laughs> Thank goodness for our kids, huh? Yeah. yeah, I think that answered the question pretty well. Okay. Um, Chris says, suicide is often seen as a last resort for those who are suffering from mental illness to find release from their suffering. And I think that's exactly why they do it. Um, thanks for that comment. There's a lot of questions and answers going on throughout the discussion. So I apologize if I'm missing some. Um, I had one, um, one interesting observation that I wanted to just put out there as I was gathering these stories for these experiences, um, I noticed that they were all pretty much the same, but depending on the person's belief system or the way they were raised or whatever is kind of depending on how, or it was kind of how their experience happened. For example, you know, you saw all your loved ones. Um, Christians often see God or, you know, um, their loved ones in white, in bright light room. Muslims will see Muhammad and Buddhists will see Buddha. And I wonder if we are, um, if that is to help us be able to track, what's the word? move on into a place that is comfortable and familiar to us? Is that why we are put in a place that makes us feel at peace? And with those that we think we should, I don't know. I'm putting that out there to see what everybody else thinks. You have any thoughts on that, either one of you? Or do you think that well, it- I think usually it's a positive experience. I have right. not really for most heard of, people it is yeah, yeah for the majority I would just say that it had some kind of peaceful element and something that was real and tangible um but I don't I've never really heard of anybody saying it was dark it was black I couldn't see anything um usually that's what they say about that tunnel and then it's light but that's the only darkness I've ever heard of 
when someone was going through this type of experience. Do you have any thoughts on why some people would see different things and experience different experiences, although they are all positive, I think for the most part. Um, there, do you think, go ahead. Are there experiences where they haven't seen either God or loved ones? Um, I don't know of any, but. No, um, I don't know that a lot of them have necessarily mentioned, hey, I saw God, but uh, most of them, all of them have mentioned relatives and loved ones and people that they knew and were familiar with. So, of course, if they saw God, they may not know what he looked like. He could have been standing there with them. I almost yeah. think, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure he looked a lot I, better than the rest of them, but. Probably I don't remember brighter. Seeing, seeing God when I was there. You I don't, don't think I so? Was, I could feel his presence, but I couldn't see him. And the room that I was in, um, as part of my religion, we go to the temple, and it was in that temple room that I saw all the people and that's often where I go to get peace and um, comfort from God so that may be why I already knew he was there and so I'm not sure we don't have to see him to know that he's there though right well, that, that light could be God I mean if he's at such a high frequency that you know he's admitting this bright bright light all that surrounding light that you saw and the people that were in the light that could be God's presence I mean we know he's if you're a Christian and you believe that that he's all around and he exists everywhere so and Deborah says I believe that if you accept Christ even at a moment of death you will be saved thank you for that comment Deborah um, Glenn Glenn says thank you for having this live stream um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of things that I experienced. Um, and, and if anybody has any more questions for Liz, put them on there and I'll, I'll see them pop up as I'm talking. Um, so Irene says, Buddhist doesn't think suicide is a bad thing. You will become a god, but it's not bad to end, oop, end your sad, painful life. I am not Buddhist, but I know when you die, you become a god. Um, there are a lot of different religions that believe we have the opportunity to become gods ourselves. So I, I do believe that that's something that, I mean, definitely. Um, when I was a young, sorry, I only see half the comments, so it's hard. I really apologize, you guys. I wish I had my um, phone up working, but it wasn't, it wasn't working on Facebook. When I was young, this is Dale, when I was young, I got spinal meningitis. Remember our priest on how to walk up to the hospital in winter storm to get my last rites. I was dying. I don't remember any of that. I remember a beautiful woman with long, dark hair walk into my room. And he, he, she wore a hat, possibly a straw hat, that the room was covered in flowers. She reached up and had had a flower from her hat that she put in my hands. She brushed her hand through my hair and told me, you're going to be fine. She kissed my head. I don't remember her walking out of the room. I remember waking up and desperately looking for that flower. I needed that flower so bad. I don't know why, but there was no flower. That's, that's interesting. That gave me goosebumps. Yeah. yeah me too. It was very touching. That's a really yeah. cool story, Dale. D D Dale, do you know who that was by chance? Dell, if you know who that was, can you comment? Glenn says, last night I had a bad night with my mom. Um, my mom was on my mind. She passed nine years ago, felt so lonely, no one to talk to. She talked to me, want to give up. My mom is always visiting me in my dreams. Maybe she's trying to comfort me from, my, from heaven. I miss my mom and I am 57. I think that dreams are a way that um, our relatives try and communicate with us. And I actually have um, a story on that myself. <clears throat> it's the only time we ever sit down and be quiet so they can talk to us. Yeah, yes, so definitely. Um, I had what some call a deathbed vision. It's kind of like a deathbed vision. But when, um, when I was young, I remember waking up one night and having a horribly bad earache and it the pain was so bad that I remember blacking out a couple of times but um, my mom 
gave me Tylenol. She gave me uh, heat packs to try and take the pain away, but nothing was working. And I remember just crying and crying. And she finally said, let's say a prayer. I don't know what else to do. So we knelt down and said a prayer. And shortly after that, I did um, fall asleep. But I remember um, waking up with my grandma sitting at the foot of my bed. And she just reached over and put her hand on my on my ear and my head and I could feel just the warmth radiating off of her hand and um, and then I fell asleep and the next morning. I woke up to the sound of the telephone ringing <clears throat> and it was actually a call from my aunt who had told my mom that my grandma had passed away that night. <clears throat> and. Um, my mom remembers, you know, looking at the clock at approximately the time that I finally settled down and went to sleep and it was roughly 2 a.m. And my grandma passed away at about 2, 10 a.m. Hmm. So that was something I'll never forget, but I, she was there. It, it was real to me. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe it was just a dream, but kind of a coincidental dream, I think. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Chantel says, when my mother-in-law dies, she's going to organize my house or kick me in the bum to get it done. <laughs> if any spirit wants to come clean my house for me, they are more than welcome. Um, so Chris says, the overwhelming majority of those who experience near-death experiences express a feeling of extreme peace and love. I believe that is God's presence. I believe so, too. Um, Deborah said, God came to, oh shoot, I just lost it. Something about God coming into a dream to her, but I, I lost it. I'm sorry. Um, I had one more experience that I could share. Um, unless you guys have something. Go ahead. So this wasn't a near death experience, but I would call it an out of body experience. Um, when I was in the fourth grade, my family and I were in a really bad car accident. And um, right before, so we were all getting ready for school. Um, I was the last one to head out to the car. Everybody was in the, at the car honking for me to hurry. And I remember thinking that I needed to say a prayer before I left. <clears throat> and so I just, I just did it real quick. It was a quick prayer, but I do remember asking, um, God to watch over and protect us that day and keep us safe. And um, as we were driving to school, we got hit by a truck as we were crossing the highway and the truck was going about 65. It had a snowmobile trailer on the back that came around and it just kind of crunched the car. So the front hit and then the back came around and hit. And me and my two brothers that were in the back seat flew out of the car and we kind of skidded across the highway. And I remember as I as I was flying out of the car, I watched my body skid across the highway, but I I could tell like I was I was there, but I wasn't there. I was kind of somewhere else because I could see myself skidding across the highway, and but I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel anything, um, and then I just woke up and I was in my body again. But I I remember watching two men helped my one brother up and get him moved over to the side of the road. Um, another man was directing traffic and stopping cars. And then my other brother was sitting on the road crying because um, he had, he thought my mom and my sister were dead. They had hit their heads on the windshields and were passed out. And I just, ha I just knew that everything was fine. There was nothing to worry about. I remember giving uh, my little brother a hug, told him they're okay. See, you know, let's go talk to them. They'll be okay. And I think, I really think that we were all watched over and protected when that event happened because it was, it was a really bad car accident, but we really, I mean, we had some broken bones and some stitches, but like nothing terribly bad um, for what we went through. But I just remember being calm through the whole thing. And I think I was able to kind of leave my body for a moment when it was experiencing something traumatic. Has anybody else ever experienced anything like that? 
or something. I rolled the school bus. Us. Yeah, Mike wasn't even there, but you did oh, come visit us in the hospital. I did. The people that helped you, were they civilians or were they? <sighs> I think so, but. People who stopped and got out of the car and helped you or people from. I never even thought of that, Mike, but I mean, I always assumed that they were just people that were driving along and stopped the car to help us, but it happened so quick. I remember watching my body fly across the highway and then I was back in it and, and awake like that. So if, if that's as quick as it actually happened, those people would have had to got, have gotten there pretty quick, but yeah. also, you know, it, it, maybe it was a lot more time had passed than what I felt like had passed too. I don't know for sure. I don't know. Hmm. But I, I know for, for me, it was only a matter of, I think I was only out one time for like 20 seconds. And I remember all of this. Um, so I don't know about time either. Well, a lot of us do believe that time between you know where where god lives and where we live are different he experiences time different than we do um chantelle said when i was nine i had a dream of my grandpa and woke up to my mother's father my parents were were up at the hospital and my grandpa died when my mom's dad passed he went into cardiac arrest and i got very sick that night again i woke up in the night to find my parents weren't there they went to the hospital and i knew my grandfather had passed so if her grand so her grandfather must have come your grandfather must have come and visited you um maybe because he knew your parents weren't there and he wanted to make sure you were okay that's a cool story um chris is asking have you ever made contact with them or have any of them tried to contact you Um, I've never personally tried to contact any relatives other than asking for some peace and comfort at times when I needed it. Any? Do you want to share that one about dad and mom telling him to move back? Oh yeah, I was going to share that actually. Um, when my father I didn't learn about this until just you, recently why don't you share it? i didn't i <laughs> i know nothing about it other than that much i just heard about it um i i thought we all knew about it but um my mom was my father passed away when um us children were really young there was five of us um ranging from eight to like eight months i believe and my mom decided she was going to move back to Arizona where she was from and so that she could have family around to help her raise kids. And she woke up one night, her family, her family um, in Arizona where she was from. And she woke up one night and my dad was sitting on the foot of her bed. And he basically told her that you need to move back to Idaho because that's where the kids need to be raised. And so she, she packed up and moved back to Idaho, but she felt that it was, I mean, it's, it was more than just a dream. He was there and he was telling her what, what he felt needed to be done. I'm kind of glad because Arizona's hot. Uh, but Arizona has spiders. It has spiders. <laughs> oh, Chris was referring to the people that helped me in my car accident. Um, no, I've never had any contact with the people that helped me in my car accident, but I did have one of the nurses um, send me a card and a candy bar. But no, I've never had any contact with the people that tried to help me in my car accident. Can you still picture them? I remember the two men that were helping my brother up. Yes. You remember ever seeing him before? No, they didn't look familiar. Hmm. Were they in white? No, they were in regular clothes. Um, two older gentlemen, I would say, in their forties, fifties, maybe. I'm. <laughs> I'm in my forties. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! I was just trying to, you know. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> 
But no, I don't. I don't know who they were. I've never seen them, or that I recall, have seen them since. So, um, did anybody else have anything they wanted to ask Liz or share with us before we sign out for the night? Um, oh, oh. Deb is asking if they were angels. You know, I never thought about it, Deb, until Mike just asked me. Um, it's very possible. It's possible, but I don't know for sure. One way or another, they probably were. Well, yeah, I was going to say they could have been angels that were sent from heaven, or they could have just been angels here on earth that were sent to help us because um, they, they got things taken care of pretty quickly, and it could have been way worse than it was if they hadn't been there, so... One way or another, they were definitely angels. Um, Deborah says, I lived in a converted funeral home as a child. Very scary. I woke up one morning with no clothes on. Um, that would be scary. Um, would be I didn't live in cold. a funeral home. Yeah, I didn't live in a funeral home, but our uncle was a mortician, and we spent a lot of time over there. Um, I did. I did. Um, experienced some really weird things over in in the mortuary when I was there. Um, I've got lots of people saying thank you, Liz. Um, thank you, Liz, for sharing your story and your experience. This has helped bring comfort and peace to a lot of people who need it. So um, I'm getting a lot of those. So thank you, Liz. Thank you. We really appreciate you joining us tonight and, and answering some questions for us. Um, hopefully, we can all feel a little bit better about what happens to us after we pass on and um, maybe be a little bit more comforted by that. I wouldn't mind having this discussion again in the future too. Um, oh, I was gonna mention one more thing real quick before we go. My husband works in the medical field and uh, when we were first married, he was a CNA and he used to have to go in and, and take care of the bodies after they passed. And he told me one time that you can really tell what kind of life a person led by how the atmosphere was and the feeling in the room was. So basically, if he felt a sense of peace or comfort, um, he could tell that that person had lived a happy life and they were ready to move on and, and things were good. Um, but if he felt a sense of unease or anxiousness, Where's the green there was, um, you could tell that the um, that they hadn't led a lie or, or maybe that they weren't ready to move on. But I thought that was interesting because my uncle who was a mortician had said the same That's thing. So. Um, so real quick before we head out um, or sign off, whatever, uh, Deborah says, please do again. So maybe we'll do another episode on this or something similar to it. We wanted to just give a, a quick, we have a couple of causes that we support. Um, and one of them is suicide prevention and mental awareness and mental health. Um, I, I just had a sad experience this week. One of my son's classmates committed suicide in the school and it's been a struggle, even for those who didn't know this kid. It's, it's such a sad thing to have happen and I I want people to know that there's help out there for them. Um, we have the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. There's also a website at suicidepreventionlifeline.org. And you can chat with someone when you go to that website if you're not comfortable calling. It's suicidepreventionlifeline.org slash chat. Um, and I also want to mention one more website that's got some very useful information. It's it's the National Alliance on Mental Health. Their mission is to provide advocacy, education, support, and public, public awareness so that all individuals and families affected by mental illness can better their lives. Um, and we just want to send our prayers and, and, and our good energy and, and positive thoughts out to all those who need it at this time. And, to that family who lost their poor son, you know, suicide is, is not just terrible for the person who, who passed away, but for their families and their friends and, and all those who loved them and, and felt bad that they weren't able to help. So hopefully we can be more aware of that and be able to help those in the future. 
Um, and then I hope we can see everybody next week. Um, we'll be back same time, same place. Uh, I think we're going to try and do the episode on a ghost town. If we can get, we've been there once, but we want to go again because there's a lot to see and, and explore. Right, Mike? Yeah. Anything you want to add Lots before of good we stuff. go? <laughs> uh, nope. I, okay. I don't think so. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Liz. We appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Liz. Sure. I you. hope everybody yeah, has fun. a everybody everybody has a great night uh chris has put the national suicide prevention information up there if anybody needs it so thank you have a good night squatch on keep it weird keep it weird good night good night <laughs>